All right, so in this video, we are going to be discussing the D8 Tanabe Sugano diagram. So this diagram is going to be applicable for uh, D8 octahedral complexes or D10 minus 8, D2 tetrahedral um, complexes. And if you're um, interested in learning about why, I have another video that shows why there's this D10 minus N relationship for tetrahedral versus octahedral. Um, but from a pragmatic standpoint, uh, this is sort of what you need to know about when to use this diagram. And so uh, I think before we do that, uh, sorry, this got cut off here. This is X axis here is Delta B. Let's go um, just Delta divided by B. Let's go over what these axes mean. So our Y axis is um, labeled E divided by B. And so what that means, that's energy um, of our transition of our states in terms of B. So it's unitless. B is um, the Rockoff parameter, which is a measure of electron-electron repulsion in transition metal complexes. It's going to be different for transition metal, different transition metal uh, elements. But it's unitless because you, it's, it's a unit of energy, and E is a unit of energy, so you divide them out, and you get something unitless. So you can think about this as how many times higher than B am I? So if I have a value of 50, for example, um, you think about that as 50 times B. If you're at a value of zero, that's the ground state. Um, same idea with delta. Delta refers to the gap, either the octahedral gap or the tetrahedral gap, de depending upon which uh, symmetry we're in. Delta O for octahedral, we call it. Delta T for tetrahedral. So um, if you're at a value on the x-axis of zero, you don't have any ligands. Um, you is a measure of ligand field strength. So you have no ligand field strength, you have no ligands, you're actually in spherical symmetry, you're just a bare transition metal ion, um, maybe something that you see in the gas phase, but that's why you have these different uh, letters here, these atomic term symbols, uh, free ion terms, so uh, triplet F, singlet D, triplet P, and can see that once you get some sort of uh, ligands, now you've descended to octahedral or tetrahedral symmetry, and you have these lines that describe the energy of these states as a function of the ligand field strength. And you have different molecular term symbols now. Um, for example, triplet A2, that's the ground state. That's this line running along the bottom. It's going to stay at uh, zero. It's the ground state all the way along, dependent, regardless of what your uh, delta, the strength of your ligands are. Um, and so now that we have that uh, under control, let's uh, think about why we have a triplet as our ground state. So for um, octahedral, we know we have uh, delta O, and we have three T2Gs that are um, lower in energy than our two EGs. And if we populate our eight electrons, um, it doesn't really matter what order we do this in, we're always going to get the same uh, spin. So if, if you pay attention to what, what I did there, um, I'll, I'll do that again. But how I, how I populated that was I kind of pretended like this was a high spin complex. So I went boom, boom, boom. And then the fourth and the fifth electron I put as if it was high spin. And then I went down for eight. If I do it the other way, um, one, two, three, and I pretend it's a low spin complex, I put six electrons in, seven, eight. You can see I got the same configuration. That's a long way of saying that D8, there can't be high spin or low spin. There's only one spin. And that spin multiplicity is a triplet, three. Why is it three? Um, why is it triplet? Well, these are paired electrons. We have two unpaired electrons. Um, and we have our 2s plus 1 rule for defining our spin multiplicity. And so we have an unpaired 1 half plus 1 half and an unpaired another plus 1 half. So we have two times one plus one, that equals three. So our spin multiplicity is three. We can do a very similar thing for a tetrahedral complex. We have to recall that um, in this case, we have delta T is what we call it, uh, the gap between these two energy levels. And it's sort of flipped. We have two on the bottom. Those are the E's. And then three on the top, those are the T2's. And we drop the G's because we don't have an inversion center in tetrahedral symmetry. G, remember, is garata. Um, U is ungarata. These are Mulliken symbol terminology that lets you know whether or not you're symmetric with respect to inversion. G means you're symmetric. U means you're anti-symmetric. 
Um, but we don't have a submit uh, inversion center in tetrahedral symmetry, so we don't want those Mollican symbols. They're not applicable. So we just drop the Gs. Small point, but you know, to be technically correct, you need to drop the Gs on all the tetrahedrals. We only have two electrons here. So for uh, we're gonna have a spin state like that. That's gonna be the ground state. Um, we're not gonna be wanting to put any of those two electrons in the higher state. And we have two unpaired electrons. So again, S is gonna be equal to one. So two S plus one equals three. So that's why we have a triplet um, as our ground state spin. So our ground state, we can write GS, uh, abbreviating it there, is gonna be triplet A2G for uh, octahedral, again, keeping the G. And our ground state for tetrahedral is just gonna be triplet A2. And I just got that from the bottom here and added a G for um, the octahedral case. All right, so now we're asking the question, you know, what are the spin allowed transitions? And our spin selection rules tell us that you only have a spin allowed transition if you preserve the spin. Our ground state is a triplet and we're gonna go to some uh, excited state. So we need to preserve that triplet. So if we go to this singlet, um, E, that's changing the spin. So that's not gonna be spin allowed. It's gonna be a very weak transition in terms of its intensity in the UV spectrum. Same thing with this singlet A1, but this singlet T2, we have a spin allowed transition. So that's gonna be our first spin allowed transition. And it's gonna be going from the ground state, triplet A2G to triplet T2G for octahedral. We drop the Gs for tetrahedral, but otherwise it's the same thing. Next one, we're looking for another triplet. There indeed is another triplet there. If we're at the same, uh, talking about the same molecule, we're gonna have the same ligand field strength, right? Because we have the same set of ligands. So I'm gonna write this right on top of this red line. Um, and it's gonna be higher in energy, now going up to about, what, 33B or so. And so we went from, again, triplet A2G, that's our ground state down here in black, to our green circled uh, excited state, triplet T1, and add the G for octahedral. Drop the Gs, same thing for tetrahedral. That's our second um, excited state. It's gonna be higher in energy. And we do have a third triplet here that's been allowed. And so we're gonna go up here in blue. And so this is going to be spin allowed going from triplet A to G, our ground state, to triplet T1G, add the Gs for octahedral, drop the Gs for tetrahedral, but otherwise the same thing. And otherwise, that's it. We uh, figured out that we have uh, three um, spin allowed transitions. So um, we're going to have three of them. And this is going to give rise to three main peaks in the UV vis uh, spectrum for either a D8 octahedral complex or a D2 tetrahedral complex using one diagram, the D8 tetrahedral diagram. We could assign them. Um, we would know that the blue transition would be the highest in energy, highest wave number, lowest wavelength. Remember, those are inversely energy and wavelength. Wave number is a unit of energy. Um, wavelength is wavelength. So like nanometers versus centimeters inverse, those are inversely proportional. But blue would be the highest wave number, lowest wavelength transition. Red would be the highest wavelength transition, um, lowest wave number, lowest energy transition, right? Because it's a small gap here. And the green transition would be somewhere in between. Um, and that's how you would uh, assign these.